It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! This week, starring special recurring guest star, Mr. Steve Barton! Yeah. He was actually crazy enough to come back twice. <laughs> Welcome to the big show. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> I'm excited to have you back. Thank you. Um, I had such a good time with you last time, and... Uh, just, uh, I would say the response was kind of overwhelming uh, while you were sitting in traffic on your way back down to where you live. They said, don't have that guy come back. <laughs> no, no, they wanted you back. People really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'm glad that you could come back. And thank you for President's Day for providing yeah. you with the day off in which you could do it. Hello, everybody. So let's see who we've got in the room. We've got Ken DePotter, Amanda West, Peter Rahill, Paul Crow, to Amanda West, Robert Willoughby. Steven Spinner, Greg Vaughn, Jaime Bo, Bochamp, uh, Amanda West, Fan Tamalonis, Martin Frog, etc., etc., etc. I could sit here and do this all day long. Hi, folks. How are you? So, um, I did only have like three and a half hours of sleep last night, so I'm liable to say something really stupid on this show because I am a little brain dead. But I'm exceptionally excited to have Steve back because there's some things I didn't cover last time with him, and he was so articulate in the stuff that we did cover that I wanted to get to this stuff. But before we do, I want to tell you, first of all, I'm going to do this so that Bria doesn't kick me under the table. Um, see that subscribe button? Click that, sucker. Subscribe. Show us some love. Come on, you're getting all this stuff for free. Share it with your friends. Even friends, you know what? Share it with people you don't like because then you'll like they'll like you better. <laughs> I don't know. And give us a thumbs up, will you? Absolutely. Okay, so that's that. Uh, also, I'm going to give you a little bio on Steve as long as he's sitting here. For those of you who didn't see him a few weeks ago when he was here and are watching the show for the first time, um... Steve is a multi-instrumentalist who plays guitar, piano, violin, and many other stringed instruments. His music can be heard on TV somewhere in the world on a daily basis. And he's had placements on ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, ABC Family, A&E, American Heroes Channel, Animal Planet, Biography Channel, Bravo, Cooking Channel, Discovery Channel, E!, Food Network, Game Show, HGTV, Investigation Discovery, Lifetime, MTV, National Geographic Channel, Oprah Winfrey Network, uh, Outdoor Channel, Oxygen, PBS, Science Channel, Style Channel, Sci-Fi, TLC, Travel Channel, Through T or True TV, sorry, Univision, VH1, and many more. Are there any more? I mean, pretty much it's everything on my cable box. That pretty much is, yeah. The the <laughs> and many more is for more to come. Okay, cool. <laughs> and he's done um, mm. other stuff like created some uh, specialty music for Mark and Brian, who are big radio celebs here in LA. He's done some commercials has done some indie films, so he is an all-around... Oh, he's also um, helped with uh, creating music for Star Wars, The Clone Wars, that one with Kevin, or... I, uh, I didn't work on that show, but uh, he was working on that show at the time when he... Uh, well, just make stuff up, it sounds up, cool. Yeah, um, I, I, would love, I would love to say I, I worked on that. No, but, but didn't you supply some music to him for something that he was uh, The Little Couple. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, I met Kevin at the rally, and the I the Taxi him, Road Rally. Taxi Road Rally gave him my CD, and he actually called me like ten days later. Wow. And he said, "I really liked your stuff. Would you like to write some music for me?" And I thought it was like, "Okay, Star Wars, sure, why not?" Uh, but it was for uh, the reality show, <laughs> a little couple. But that was great. I, I did a couple years uh, worth of cues, and I had like up to ten placements per episode. It was wow. It was really great. That was a short subject. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Steve has also written, and yes, this is why I'm having him on the show. Not that I haven't known him for years and I really like him, but um, he wrote a book that I'm really impressed with and that like, a bunch of you, Bria said it looked like about 100 people bought the book after he was on the show last time, and we've not had one complaint, only compliments. So this is the book, Writing Production Music for TV by Steve Barton. Um, the book came out just before the road rally, right? Like November or October? Uh, it was officially released in October, but it wasn't in stock like in Amazon until uh, mid-November. Okay. Because they, you know, it's the way Amazon does it. They have to have a lot of pre-orders before they actually right. buy inventory. You know, they want to make sure that 
people really want it. Um, oh, I should mention that the link is in the description underneath the video on the left side of your screen. Go down to where it says, uh, what does it say, Bria? Like mm -hmm. uh, info or something? Yeah. Yeah, it's the video description. Oh, okay. If you want to buy it. It's in there. Uh, what made you decide to write the book, and how did you get it published? Because that's no small feat in and of itself. Yeah. Um, Ron Middlebrook is the uh, owner of Center Stream Publishing, and I've, I've known Ron for probably 25 years, and I've done work for him over the years. I've done uh, musical notation. I've done tr audio transcriptions. I've done audio res restoration on the Jimi Hendrix tracks, uh, personal cassettes. Um, I've just done so much work for him over the years. I've produced CDs that are, that are accompany his books. He has like a lot of his books are like guitar books, how to play blues guitar and uh, you know how to play ukulele. And he's been after me for years to to write a book. Wow. And I, I talk to him every year at the NAM show. And uh, the NAM 2017, we had a nice meeting, and he said, Steve, you really need to write a book. And I just thought, you know, Ron. I'm a guitar player. What can I write about that hasn't already been written? <laughs> I can't write. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know if I could write, to be honest. And you can. I, and I, you and I went I went home and thought about it, and I thought, well, no, I'm not gonna write about guitar. I'm gonna. What have I been doing the last ten years? And that's production music. And I thought I have all this great experience now, and especially what I've learned through Taxi. Um, didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> Uh, did you, when I interviewed you for the passenger profile, um, close to two years ago mm -hmm. now, I remember at the time shooting you back an email saying you're incredibly articulate, detailed. You wrote really long, but not sleepy answers, long like, wow, this is really good stuff answer. So it doesn't surprise me that the book is as good as I, it is. I appreciate it. Um, I, I had a blast writing it. Um, I, I honestly, like I said, I didn't know I, I could write. Um, my publisher gave me a lot of encouragement as we went through and he said, you're a really good writer, Steve. <laughs> he was right. Uh, how much, just so people know, and then we'll jump into the musical stuff, but how much from, you know, let's say for every 2,000 words you write, how much of that as an author actually makes it into the book or does the publisher slash editor go in and go, no, this got to go, that's got to go, or do they leave it pretty much intact and mostly move things around and clean up your poor use of the English language. Uh, no, I, I did all the editing. He, he, wow, he actually, he didn't give me any notes on it other than at the very end he said, you really need to write a glossary because there's a lot of terms in here that beginners might not be familiar with. And the glossary is really long and it probably took me two weeks to, to do just that. Uh, but actually all the editing, I probably edited it down by about 20%. Um, I, I, I did use some software that helped with some of the grammar and some of the well spelling is you know automatic right as you as you're typing but you know unless grammar, it's in all caps then it doesn't catch it yeah and just <laughs> just you know simplifying sentences so they're not ov overly ver verbose right um, if you've got five commas in one sentence you might be doing something wrong um, and I do use a lot of commas and and it's <laughs> you know it's kind of the way my brain works but that's not how I wanted it to be um, conversational yeah which the thing that you wrote um, the interview you did for the taxi newsletter was very conversational mm -hmm. you, you sounded intelligent yet conversational which is I think where you want to be as an author because you want people to be able to latch onto it not I find that a lot of collegiate books look down on the students mm -hmm. very professorial like I know stuff that you don't and mm -hmm. I'm gonna use really big words and complicated sentences so that you still don't know after you've read my book mm -hmm. your book does not have that problem there it is once again buy it seriously uh, I mean we heard from a lot of people that got the book and they absolutely love it and as you can see I've been reading it I actually read it before it was on last time, but now I've gone back for a second pass to come up with the really intelligent questions that I'm about to ask him. Um, oh, before we jump in, I want to play you an example of an instrumental cue so that, uh, remember, the, the headline for this show, the subject line, was how songwriters become instrumental composers. And the reason that I'm going to, I'm taking that tact in, in this episode of the show is I didn't want to just do a repeat of what we did last time or even an expanded version of it, but there are so many people that I've met that have just given up on being a songwriter because they hear the stuff on the radio and they go, I can't do that. Well, that, that was me. Yeah, and, and so there you go. And, um, and then you discovered this stuff and they go... 
composer. Oh, do I have to go out and buy a baton? Do I have to sit there, you know, and, and write stuff mm -hmm. on the staff? No. Look, if he can do it, almost anybody can. <laughs> no. It's a uh, glaring endorsement. <laughs> now, he's actually pretty musically sophisticated, but you don't really need to be for many of the genres. Some you do. If you're going to do orchestral stuff, you got to know what he knows. If you're going to do um, swampy acoustic guitar, Nah. Well, you know, let's talk about orchestral music. Um, you can learn a lot about orchestration and, and how it, you look at musical notes as colors, and certain colors blend better than others. But a big part of writing for orchestra is writing in an idiomatic way, meaning writing the way an instrument can perform those notes. Right. Real, how it would realistically be played. Is that a well, fair statement? Well, for example, you would not write a flute note that sustains for 30 seconds. Right. Because they have to breathe at some point. Um, it, it, that's also true of programming drums. Uh, it, it would be technically impossible for a drummer to hit a snare, hit a, a hi-hat, hit a tom-tom, hit a crash cymbal, hit a ride cymbal, all at the same time because you only have two hands. Okay, so if you want to perform like a true drummer or, or any particular instrument, yeah. you need to understand how that instrument works and what it's capable of doing. Now, in the old days, MIDI instruments, um, a, you would have a flute patch, but you would be able to play it on the full 88 keys of a keyboard, mm -hmm. where that's completely out of range for that instrument. Right. Modern libraries now are limited to the typical range of an instrument. You have to force it to go out of that range. You could if you wanted to. Well, they actually don't re even record it in those. Now, there are virtuoso right. musicians that can hit you know, super high notes or, well, most low notes, you're limited by the instrument itself. Mm -hmm. But like a trumpet player could hit like you know, a double high C, you know, where an, you know, a high school trumpet player could not. Um, so most, most libraries today uh, don't allow you to make those kind of glaring errors instrument-wise. So your chances of sounding more realistic are better. But again, if you go back to colors, how the instruments blend, then that's where you need to learn a little bit about orchestration. So, yeah, but again, that does not apply to doing a swampy acoustic guitar cue that would be, you know, just a, a three-chord figure repeated with a bottleneck overdub. Right. I mean, that's... So, uh, what I'm trying to say is, for those of you who are songwriters, and you keep hearing composer, composer, composer by me, um, don't let it scare you. It's just a word that's commonly used. I mean, yes, Steve is a composer, but he used to be a songwriter, and he's made it all the way through recovery. <laughs> he's a recovering songwriter. There that's you right. go. <laughs> I, I have a songwriter PTSD. <laughs> uh, but that's true. Uh, being a creative artist creating music, you are composing. So right. it doesn't necessarily correspond to orchestral music exclusively. Right. You make a composition, so therefore right. you are a composer. Sure. If, you, if you're whistling, you're a composer. Or you have too much time on your hands. Uh, Bria, uh, or Steve, would you like to tell Bria which one you'd like to play first as an example of something that... Can we? Do you have something simple on there, even if it's a repeat of what we did last time? That would be a good example for people who are songwriters and go, okay, I'm believing Lasco that I might be able to go into composing. Um, I'm guessing this is probably all your best work because it'd be <laughs> silly not to bring that. Um, you know, let me zip around and take a look at the okay. list of files real quick. Oh, look, I've got the sunlight on my shirt today, and I've got paper hanging up on the blinds trying to stop it. But is it? Uh, boy, I'd love to play the uh, Jane piece. He wants to play a piece that was on um, Jane the Virgin. Unfortunately, we think we might have network issues if we do that. Um, uh, let's play just another day. This is a dramedy cue. And although it is an orchestral piece, uh, it's simple in the instrumentation. Okay. So what's this one called? Just another day. Just another day. We've got level over here. Hit it, Bria. <laughs>
I saw something at Jose Davide says, so simple, I'm making it way too complicated. And you know what, Jose, I don't even know your music, and you're right. Why do I know that? Because everybody does that. Everybody in the industry, who, or everybody who starts out to be a composer, seems to think that the best composer gets picked, uh, which might be true for a scoring gig, uh, or that the best piece of music gets picked. Um, my experience has been that it's the most appropriate piece of music for that scene. Is mm -hmm. that a, a fair statement? Yeah. Uh, you notice in the middle section, I gave it a lot of breathing room. There was mm -hmm. a lot of stops um, just to give... It, it was meant to be a comical piece, per, you know, very lighthearted. Right. And and to give them a lot of space to, to use it um, in a scene. So, it, you know... It, Get rid of a lot of notes. I mean, I tend to write something with a lot of notes, and like with every instrument, and then just start pulling pieces out and, and see what you end up with. So different than your writing style with the, uh, with the written word. You're, with the written word, you didn't have to get rid of much. With music stuff, you know why? Because with the written word, you're the star. The stuff you're writing on this in the pages of this book, it is everything. Mm -hmm. In the context of a TV show, you're the supporting emotion. Right, right. The the dialogue is the star. Well, absolutely correct. The the dialogue and the actors, um, uh, you know, hopefully you're going to be a little bit more than just wallpaper behind behind the scene. So if you can support it in any way, you know, and give it some kind of uh, uh, flavor or uh, you know, make it stand out in some way, and and I, I find that um, giving it a lot of space, a lot of stops. Is really you know silence is is deafening, <laughs> huh? because when you because when it comes back, and then it's like it's like something new and exciting. Yeah. Um, all good stuff, absolutely. And, and it also makes for good edit points for the editor. Oh, speaking of editors, um, oh man, I'm about to go into the sun mode. Uh, <laughs> I want to let you guys know that. For the Taxi Road Rally, our annual convention that's coming up uh, November 1st through the 4th of 2018 here in Los Angeles, and it is absolutely free for every taxi member and a guest, uh, as opposed to the ones that cost 375 bucks or more per ticket. Uh, we are opening the entire Road Rally this year with a young lady who did such a spectacularly good job last year. She's a video editor, a first-rate video editor. She used to be a story editor, so she brings a little something extra to the party. Uh, her name is Laurel Ostrander, and she did a thing for us last year on how video editors, who, by the way, almost virtually all the music you hear in a reality show is picked and placed by the video editor. Um, they're given bins of music, basically a bucket of music by the music supervisor who says, here, everything there is kosher for this show. You can use any of it, um, but you pick it. Um, she did a spectacular thing for 90 minutes last year that I thought was maybe the best thing I've ever seen on the stage at the Road Rally, probably the best thing ever. I was listening back to it this past weekend and was just blown away how much Incredible information there was, and yet we only had 400 people-ish in the ballroom. So I'm bringing her back, and she is the keynote for the beginning of the Road Rally this year, and I'm having her do two hours. You were in the room. And it was fantastic, yeah. Just it, The coolest part was you understood why she was doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And once you know the why... I, I learned a lot. And, and you're I, highly experienced. And I thought I knew everything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's twice now in the show he's admitted that. Takes a man, you know? <laughs> uh, okay, so I talked about composer doesn't mean you have to write and program orchestral music. Um, would you... Uh, oh, this is from my list of questions in the email that went out to you guys. All right, you know the answer to this. We've not discussed this, um, but how, to f how taxi members who are making tens of thousands of dollars a year in extra income, how do they do that when they have jobs and families and all kinds of adult responsibilities, which you would fall under that category mm -hmm. because you have a real job 
and a family, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And yet you're making, you know, a nice chunk of extra money doing something you love. How do you do it? Yeah, work-life balance is is really complicated. Um, and I think people feel like you need to sacrifice your family to be an artist and write music, and that's really the wrong answer. Um, you can find the balance, and you have to make compromises. And one of the keys is is to just be really efficient in everything that you do, so you're not wasting a lot of time. Um, Go ahead. So <laughs> I, I'm just double checking and make sure my levels are okay. still good. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, like my life, I I leave early in the morning and I get home at you know six thirty, seven o'clock, and have dinner with my wife, and then maybe I have two hours in the evening to to write music. Are you allowed to talk about your job in the CIA? Yes, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> Not on camera. Um, <laughs> what do you really do? Um, I write iOS software, uh, iPhone apps for uh, Fox Studios. Okay. And so that's a big boy job. That comes with real responsibility and I'm assuming ongoing education. You have to stay on top of the various types of things, mm -hmm. you know, the plugins and what have you that, you know, so... Um, you can't you can't do this like at your desk while you're at work. I mean, you've got a, a lot the time when you get home. Mm -hmm. And is it? I, I don't know. I'm not asking you a question. I know the answer to. Is, do you do two hours a night every night? Um, well, it depends. If if I have projects that I'm working on, in that case, I'll, I'll I'll work two to three hours every night, and then like a full weekend. But I usually that usually doesn't happen too often. And it may only last a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I, I try to do something all the time, uh, but you know there's burnout. You know, so that's where you have to find time to be, you know, with your family. Uh, my kids are now grown; they're out of the house, so I don't really have that problem anymore. It was it was harder when the kids were small, but now you have grandkids. But now. <laughs> I, I just spent yesterday at Travel Town at my granddaughter Molly's second birthday party, and mm -hmm. it is awesome because you don't really have to bring a lot of the stuff or do the setup or anything. You just show up, take a few pictures, kiss the grandkid on the head, say "Oh, happy birthday," and then go home. Right? But, yeah. um, so what I what I like to recommend he's is so serious. when you when, <laughs> when you have such a short amount of time, um, is to focus on on grouping tasks. So you're doing all your composing at once. So you're not jumping around from composing to, to mixing to emails. You know, stay focused on, on, on one task for a period of time, get it done, and then move on to another task. If you're doing this full time, then you can break those tasks into, the, into a day, like in the mornings you answer phone calls and emails for two hours, and then you, and then you compose for two hours, and then you mix for two hours, and then you you know do something else for two hours. Um, it's a sort of the same separation of tasks, but you're separating it over days instead of hours. So for the people who are watching the show that are songwriters and have been for years and years, and they are now desirous of becoming composers, uh, they're not at the point yet because they're just starting out where they're going to need to be doing meta tags yet. Um, or returning emails yet, all the other kind of uh, stuff that goes along, you know, part and parcel to the compositional side. So if they're just starting out as a composer, um, two hours a day, what would you do? What's the first thing? Okay, I'm going to wave my magic wand and somebody out there in TV land is, has made the decision that as soon as we're done with this episode, he or she is going to go sit down, uh, hit the, the power button, sit down at their keyboard, um, turn on Pro Tools or whatever they're using, and start composing. What's the first thing they should do? Know what your target is. What are you writing for? Are you just looking at a keyboard and a, and a blank piece of score paper or an empty DAW project? Um, if you know what, you're, what, you're trying, what your end game is, what you're trying to compose, that's half the battle. A lot of people don't, though. And mm -hmm. you know what? We probably see a lot of people lose the battle because they sit there scared to death. They look at the keyboard and mm -hmm. go, well, this is it. Today's the day. I've got to really start now. i got to do this. Um, and they freeze because they just don't know what to do. So mm -hmm. let's give them some advice on how to pick that starting point and how they should determine 
what it is they should start with on day one, note one. Right. So should I write a tension cue today? Should I write a swamp cue? Should I write a dramedy cue? First of all, what are your strengths? What genres are you comfortable with? What if they don't know yet? Because they're not a composer yet. Well, do you do you play in a band? Do you uh, do you listen to music? What is it that you love about music? And and you know what what does your heart desire? I mean, let's start there. If you don't if you don't have any ideas, what was, what did your heart desire before you became a composer when you were a songwriter? What was well, your genre of choice? Uh, but for me, because I had been writing orchestral music um, s- since the '70s, I've you know I've already spent a lot, and I had been doing film scoring stuff. You had a predilection. So I knew <laughs> I could write instrumental music, and I actually wanted to only focus on on orchestral music. Even though I'm a guitar player, I really didn't want to do rock stuff. I didn't even want to do swamp stuff, and that's the easiest thing to do mm-hmm. because it's only a couple instruments that I can do it really quickly. Um, but I, I'm trying to do what I love. So let's take a, a country songwriter because country is a popular genre and a lot of people write it. So you're a country songwriter. You're a little frustrated that you've been cranking away at country now for five years or ten years, and you haven't had a, a cut yet in Nashville. And you're watching this show, and you go, you know, maybe I'll try this, comp- you know, compositional thing. Uh, what should they do to go from being a country songwriter to? Okay, so if you've decided on a genre of music that you want to write, find out what it is you should be writing. In other words, what what is a cue? What is an instrumental cue? What does it sound like? Does it sound like a song? Kind of, but not really. Mm -hmm. So how can I learn about that? Well, let's target a TV show. What TV show is playing the kind of music you want to write? Is it Duck Dynasty or is it, I don't know, Swamp Brothers? I don't know. Uh, Swamp People, that's still on the air. Okay. Um, And that's the one about the guys who go out and catch alligators. Okay. Um, Watch the show. Uh, you can find a lot of them, the episodes on YouTube and really listen to the music and find out what they're using. Um, and if you, you find cues that sound like the kind of music you like to write, then break it down. What are the instruments they're using? How, what are the arrangements like? You had a great list. Um, page 92. Oh, I remember that. Uh, good. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm going to have you go down the list rather than me read it off and you nod your head. Why don't you tell? Because that was extremely comprehensive. I thought. Oh, all right. Okay, I remember this. I remember writing this. <laughs> <laughs> um, determine the genre, style, and moods. Okay, this is the audio book version. If you were wondering. Um, we're talking about dissecting uh, a cue. So we're going to determine the genre, the style, and the moods that a cue is evoking. Then we're going to break down the cue by analyzing the following items. The key. Is it a major or minor key? What is the specific key? What is the tempo, the beats per minute? What is the total length of the cue? Most cues range in the a minute and a half to two and a half minutes, but this is difficult to know if you're watching a show because they're all, they may only use 12 seconds of it. Right, so four you, seconds you, you here, 19 know. there. Um, is it a good rule of thumb as long as we're on that topic that generally your cues should be like 90 seconds to two minutes ish? Exactly. That's I I shoot for 90 seconds minimum. Okay. And I rarely go over two minutes unless unless a specific client asks for three minutes or whatever they they want and people are going to ask the question later so if i go two minutes and four seconds is that okay and the answer is it depends okay (laughs) um most of the time i my personal opinion is if you are new to this and getting ready to pitch to multiple libraries who are the people that are film tv specific publishers most of them aren't going to say i love that cue but it's two minutes and 14 seconds long um, so therefore, I don't want it. Uh, worst case scenario is they say, can you make it come in at two minutes even? Typically, they're just going to take it as is. I, I think they generally will. I mean, because honestly, they usually chop up these cues anyway to a very short amount of time. 
um, if they have a specific scene that they're cutting to, where like it's a uh, like a montage scene where they know it's going to run a minute and a half to a minute 45, they then they definitely want a longer cue that's that's going to work in that that section. Okay, continue um, please. Okay, what is the form? Is it an ABA form? It, you know, can you identify this as a typical form, or is it something unique, through composed, which means it just it never repeats a section? Uh, what's the instrumentation? Uh, identify every instrument that's used. Is it appropriate for this style of cue? Identify any edit points. Are there any identifiable breaks that an editor could use? Which we were talking about earlier. You put some in just to create some error, but also they serve the second purpose of, of giving, making easy edit points. Right, and edit points don't always have to be silence. It's just a, a logical place in the music that makes sense to edit. If we can stop and dwell on that one for a moment, the the silent edit point syndrome. I remember we started writing in a lot of our listings, uh, which are descriptions that go out to our members as to what's being sought by the industry, and we would include language in there that says easy edit points. So somebody somewhere on the forum said, oh, that means a full rest. So now we're getting in stuff like disco music with full rest stops in it for editors to use. Um, and it just sounded inappropriate. So the fact that you just said it doesn't have to be a pause or a rest, it can just, you know, you can cut on a, on a kick drum, on a hi-hat, on the first note of a guitar solo, on a, almost anything that shows up in a waveform is an edit point. But it can also be a rest that feels natural to the type of music. Mm -hmm. And just think of phrases, and I use this example throughout the book, and it seems childish but it's twinkle twinkle little star <laughs> and it's to me it's the perfect example of form in uh, production music and it's da 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 okay that's the a section that's a perfect edit point mm -hmm. okay Inle unless you're you have a note sustaining leading into the next section it's probably a, a good edit point okay there's no silence but it's the end of a phrase and it's a logical place in the music okay I, I think that would be a great follow-up book. Everything I know about composing, I learned from Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> um, okay, edit points. Does it does it contain a melody? Okay, so if it's a full version, it probably has a melody, uh, or is it some type of stem or alternate version? Um, what is the range of notes the melody covers? Now, this is kind of important because um, melody versions depending on the instrument, could conflict with dialogue on the screen. So we have to be mindful of, of the sound of the melody instruments. And if they choose a version of your cue that doesn't have the melody, it's probably because your melody version is interfering with dialogue. What type of movement does the melody use? Is it stepwise movement? Or is it leaps, jumping up a third or fifth, or an octave? Um, is it does it work with the movement of the dialogue, or is it obtrusive? Uh, well, you wouldn't know the dialogue because you haven't seen the show and you're creating this ostensibly for a catalog or a publisher. So, But it brings us to an interesting point, which we'll elaborate on later, which is knowing the type of show. Well, you, but you look at the show and that the what is the choice that the editor made? Why did they... That tune has oh, a melody. about this one we're watching to learn, right. We're watching to learn. So why did they choose that particular cue? Was that melody crazy wild all over the place? Or did they choose it because it's it has a limited range of, of, of uh, you know, three or four notes, uh, 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 less than an octave, or, you know. Right. If it, and, and if the show were, you know, witty, fast repartee, you might use something that reflects that in the music versus something that's legato and mm -hmm. just looks like, wow, why did they use that? Mm -hmm. It would be obviously out of place. Correct. Um, does does the cue modulate or change keys? If it modulates, does it return to the original key? And was that key change necessary? Do instruments drop out at any point? How interesting is the arrangement? Does it bore the listener by never changing? Uh, and, and this is a real key to, uh, to working with, with simple arrangements by modifying the instruments coming in and out. So you don't have to really have a lot 
of, of, of chord changes or a lot of melody, but if you have instruments coming in and out, it changes the color of, of the music and it makes it a little bit more interesting for them to use. Because if it's just a repeated four bar phrase over and over and over, right. it's, well, at that point, then it becomes wallpaper. And it could be well executed wallpaper, but somebody else who put a little salt and pepper on their wallpaper is going to get the placement as opposed to your boring wallpaper. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, when do instruments make an appearance? Does the cue build by adding instruments a little at a time, or are they always present? Um, so, good cues um, have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and they build progressively in um, in energy and excitement. That's good. So they're not just you know stagnant pieces of music. And you mentioned, uh, and it's really important uh, for people who are new to this to understand that most of the time your piece of music, 95, maybe 99% of the time, it's not going to be used in its entirety. And as we saw on stage last year with Laurel Ostrander, she would start listening to a cue and go, okay, this is in the ballpark of what, of what I'm looking for, but the scene has more energy. Mm -hmm. than this so I'm gonna go and she would just start scooting down the waveform and, and she would actually look for the waveform to be a little bigger knowing instinctively or intuitively that that is probably going to be representative of more energy so she would take her cursor go down there hit it go there you go that's I like the cue it's got the right personality and the right mood for the uh, the scene that I'm cutting right now um, and it's got uh, a, a full complement of instruments at this point in the queue to add the right color and energy that you were just describing. Right. And, and if you've been doing this for any amount of time, you intuitively start writing in that way. So it does build to some sort of crescendo. Yep. Uh, and finally, does the queue use any hooks? Are there any identifiable melodic or rhythmic hooks that can make the queue interesting? Are the hooks overused or are they appropriate? Uh, so that's that's quite a bit of stuff to yeah. to think about when you're when you're analyzing cues that are, are being used in shows. But you know what? And I'm gonna plug the book shamelessly because it, it's good enough that I should um, buy this book. If all you used this book for were pages 92 and 93, <laughs> um, you, you'd get your money's worth many times over because this checklist is awesome. All right, so uh, let me go down my list, see what else I have not asked you yet. Um, oh, the secret people that have made the decision, songwriters, I'm going to write less songs, and I'm going to take a shot at this instrumental composing thing. Um, and I keep hearing that Taxi has these members that are making six-figure incomes. So what must I do to be better than them or like them or brilliant like them? And there's a reason that they're making six figures aside from, let's just assume that all the music is pretty darn good, but maybe not exceptional. Because again, it's not about who's the greatest composer in the world. So what do you think it is that they're doing that got them to that six figure level? Well, they've gone through the learning curve of making all the mistakes and understanding what it is that is needed in production music yeah so they they've they've written all the bad music they've <laughs> written all the bad arrangements they've they've had the bad melodies that interfere with dialogue they've learned that and now they're a seasoned professional okay and at that point it simply becomes a numbers game thank you that's the answer i was looking for <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 yeah ding. you are a winner sir uh let's talk about the numbers game because we do have taxi members that are making six-figure incomes we have uh, quite a large number of members that are making, you know, five, 10, 20 grand, 50 grand a year, and a healthy handful that are making six figures, some of them uh, multiple six figures, and it is a numbers game. So I think I know the magic number that gets you over the 100K mark. What do you think that number is? Because we have many of the same friends. Okay, well, th there's, there's numbers of how many cues you've written, how many cues you have in libraries, and how many cues have been placed on a show. Okay, so let's talk about the number that you have in libraries that are published, 
and not counting alt mixes or alt edits mm -hmm. or anything like that. Just, you know, here's QA, QB, QC. Mm -hmm. um, from what I've been told from some of our more prolific taxi members, they've given me a number. Oh, yeah, when I got over this number, the money really started to roll in. And you won't get there in a week, I'm telling you that right now, or a month, or a year. Well, I, I haven't actually done the math on it. Um, Paul Curteau will. Okay. <laughs> I can see some math head. <laughs> not, not meth head, math head. <laughs> um, wow. Because there is a placement in a show, but then the show can perform multiple times. Right. Um, you can you can have a placement. So here's the thing: you can have a placement on a on a reality show on a cable network that doesn't pay as well, but it airs a thousand times. Right. Or you can get a, a placement on a network show, like a, a, let's say an award show mm -hmm. that only airs once. Right. So even though the network pays a lot more, the difference in accumulative income is way different. You'd almost want to take the, the reality shows as, as because a, it adds up over time, yeah. over its lifetime. A friend of mine once said, who was kind of the Clive Davis of the music library world, he said to me, Michael, in his radio announcer voice, it's a penny business. And it is a penny. People are appalled when they get their first, you know, PRO statement. And go, oh my God, I only got 17 cents for that spin. Mm -hmm. But the key is to get 17 cents a gazillion times because mm -hmm. it does add up. And you're, I agree with you. You're absolutely right about. Um, sometimes you get a $2,000 placement. Sometimes you get a $12 placement. Sometimes, a lot of times, you get placements in reality shows where you're getting no money up front. There is mm -hmm. no sync fee, but the back end is repetitively cumulatively re, repetitively cumulative um that's a mouthful yeah it is and i stayed up really late to come up with that uh, <laughs> hence well, the three and a half hours we, we know that this this is a get rich slow scheme <laughs> right exactly um so the number that that i've heard from at least three of our mutual friends who are successful members that are over the six figure line is it took them about a thousand to fifteen hundred cues for getting the alt edits and alt mixes. They had to get about that many, and they got the that number of cues in a multiple of libraries. So not just like one library or two libraries, but they probably have you know like fifty in this one and one hundred and twelve in that one and seventy eight in another one and four hundred in that one, and at some point it just starts adding up. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's uh, you, and it has to be consistent. You have to keep feeding the machine. You can't just stop after you have ten cues out there and <laughs> and they're in a show and they're playing every week because that show's going to stop at some point. You have to keep feeding it. So you have to write a lot of music and keep getting it in the libraries and hopefully you've established a relationship with a library where they're using your or they're they're promoting your music a lot more because they can't even guarantee that that an editor is going to choose your cue. No, and, and many of our again mutual friends who are taxi members who have become successful um, have often told me that they're shocked how it's just like one one cue that they didn't even think was their best work has been the one that's made them the most money and that they've got a vast number of cues out there that are making no money right that's that's definitely for sure um <laughs> that's why i you know you try not to get too emotionally involved in your own music right because it's something you think this is my baby and this is going to make me a million dollars and <laughs> that's the one that's never going to get placed you know right. the one that you just spit out because you were tired and you just had to finish it that's one that's going to get used a lot you just don't know um let's talk about the recording setup because one of the objections that i get from people who are going from songwriter to composer is that oh you know I don't have much of a home studio. Um, describe your studio. I have uh, I have three desktop computers. I could do it all in one, um, but I have my main computer, which is my DAW digital audio workstation. I have a second computer, which I use as a slave computer, so it it plays all the sample libraries that I keep loaded all the time. These are my orchestral libraries. 
so that when I open my DAW with a template, all those instruments are available right now. I don't have to worry about loading them. Um, and that's a luxury. That's something you've kind of worked your way is. up to that and earned. But my, my <laughs> wife has her computer, and I'm borrowing. I, I use her computer as a slave as well. And when she's not using it, it's, it's acting as a slave. So it's running some additional instruments. So it's just a convenience, but you can, you can do it with less. Uh, we both know taxi members. I, I can think of one in particular that did an awesome, uh, well, say his name, Stephen Baird, uh, played uh, an EDM piece once uh, on an episode of Taxi TV. He was using about a five-year-old 13-inch MacBook Pro. <laughs> I said, how much memory is in that thing? How much RAM do you have? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> he really didn't. And so that means it probably had the standard amount, which was like two or four gigs, not very much RAM. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a fancy, beefy you know, computer. Probably cost around 1200 bucks when it was new. Um, and, and a little two-octave keyboard. Mm -hmm. Uh, depending on the style of music, now I will say orchestral music does require a lot more power because the libraries are more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, my main machine only has 32 gig, I say only. Um, yeah, that's not nothing. That's, but, you know, 64 gig machines are, are becoming s standard mm -hmm. and 128 gig, you know, then, then it starts coming, getting into a little bit more money. Um, so that's why I have to have a second computer. And between the two computers, they're both 32 gig computers. Between them, it becomes one 64 gig computer, and it was just cheaper to do it that way. Um, but if you're, if you're running a lot of orchestral libraries, you, you're going to need a little bit more power. But if you're doing maybe a lot of electronic music, those samples aren't that heavy. They're not that demanding on resources. So you can get away with a smaller, like a 4 gig laptop. I, I was at Costco at 6 o'clock last night. They actually had an iPad with 128 gigs of RAM in it, and the thing was like 300 and change. That's insane. It is. I couldn't believe that. I, I like walked by it, went, did one of those, and came back and went, wow, that actually says that. Crazy. Um, I'm trying to find stuff that we haven't covered yet uh, already in my bullet points. Um, so is it a fair statement? Because, again, we both know people. Uh, one I'm thinking of in particular would be um, Matt Vanderbo. And he's got an iMac. Um, again, I don't think it's that tricked out with a ton of RAM or anything. And he's got like a you know two-octave keyboard. I joke because he's got it sitting in a... Um, in a tool shed. Like in a tool shed? I've seen a picture yeah. of that. That's pretty great. I mean, literally in a tool shed in his backyard, and he's got his uh, computer, his keyboard, and I believe his monitors um, sitting on top of just a, a simple little table with like a bath mat sitting underneath it to keep it from sliding around. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have any acoustic treatment. Uh, he doesn't mm -hmm. have, you know, $5,000 worth of walls built within walls. Um, and the guy was able to walk away from his job as a college professor because he's now making enough money with his music after only like five years um, that he was able to do that. So my point is that don't let that be your excuse to not start. Do not scare yourself out of starting by saying, geez, that means I'd have to go buy a big beefy computer. That means I'd have to learn a lot about programming. If you've followed Steve's advice and picked what comes naturally to you and what is at the intersection of what the industry needs and what you do, which let's go to the, back to the country person and the alligator shows, um, you don't need a lot of powerful computers or expensive microphones to, to do to lay down an acoustic guitar, maybe a you know, arpeggiated banjo picking thing or a bottleneck slide. Uh, right. I, I do most everything in the box, meaning <clears throat> virtual instruments. Um, occasionally when I do record guitars, um, I only have a few mics, and I've been primarily using this gauge mic that I, I bought at the rally for like 100 bucks a few years ago. You know what? I'm going to bring one of those out because I just noticed that I, I literally found this microphone sitting on my... Uh, yeah, this was a large diaphragm microphone, and it works great on guitars. Uh, I used it on that uh, Dobro episode of Taxi TV, and uh, God, it just works great. It wasn't expensive, and 
you know, for, for what we're doing with production music, the sound is excellent. So back when Rob Shirelli owned Gage Microphones, he would sell these for 99 bucks at the Road Rally, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And That's what I bought mine for. I mean, that's a lot of microphone for $99. Yeah. It sounds great. Sounds great on acoustic guitar. Sounds great on vocals. Um, Shirelli no longer owns the company. I'm not plugging it uh, because he's an extremely close friend of mine. I'm plugging it because it's a great sounding microphone. So go to gaugeusa.com, I believe. I think it's, it might be gauge-usa. Sounds right. Um, they've upped the price. They're no longer... Uh, I think it's like 250 now. Yeah, and still worth it at that price. Right, because if you're going to buy a Neumann for five to seven thousand dollars you know the difference in the sound quality for what we're doing is not significant enough to justify the cost in my mind I have never met anybody in the industry that said wow if only they'd used a Neumann on that acoustic guitar I would have signed that yeah. artist that piece used it in my show nothing yeah, exactly and, and exactly. I like Neumann microphones I yeah. use plenty of them but that does the job um, okay uh, okay. Oh, let's talk about chord progressions, um, and keys and chord progressions, specifically stuff that you wrote. Um, let me find it now. There we go. Let's talk about the keys uh, in this section. Oh, right. How the keys relate to the music. Right. I, I found this, um, actually I found this, I probably found it on YouTube originally, uh, but it was this uh, University of Kansas professor, Scott Murphy. He analyzed relationships from one chord to another and uh, identified their musical con emotional connotation as used in film scoring. And he used a lot of musical examples of how one chord going to the, the second chord how often it's used in various scenarios. Um, like in a major key, uh, the one chord, like let's say in the key of C, going to a two chord, but as a major, so C major to D major, um, that works well in uh, something that defines protagonism. And uh, the example he used was Back to the Future. Uh, and that's using a, 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 the Lydian scale. But that particular chord progression is often seen in, in like heroic type of uh, settings. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and he just gives a, a, a whole series of, of examples. Uh, and he has actually a great, you should look him up on, on YouTube. He, he has a great little example of, of how he's sort of emulating these various movie themes yeah. in these chord progressions. And they're just it's just amazing. Um, and, and to be able to analyze the, the relationships between these notes and these chords and how it, it, it works our e emotions yeah. in a certain way, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. I found him quite by accident uh, about two weeks ago um, on a Sunday, sitting at home on, on my bed as I'm prone to do with my laptop, working away. And I decided to take a YouTube break and decided to take a musical YouTube break and I found Scott Murphy. Okay. And the exact video that you're talking about. Okay, you saw it great. I, I did see it and I completely, <clears throat> I, I, I'm astonished that he doesn't have more views on that thing, number one. I thought he did a really good job on it. So I saved it and it will be coming to you in the form of the taxi newsletter uh, probably in the last few days of this month. So just know that the exact video that Steve is talking about, coincidentally, is heading your way. Yeah, definitely watch it. It's really eye-opening, uh, and it, it, it actually helped me. Um, let's talk about melody. Uh, one of the things that people get hung up with is melody, and, and I feel like they spend a lot of time concentrating on melody, and they think that they've got to come up with this really well-composed melody that shows how good they are and how sophisticated and virtuosity uh virtuosic <laughs> what's the the uh what a virtuoso there i'll conjugate it that way what a virtuoso he or she is and then i just look at it and go mm, you 
really didn't need to go that far. So can you mm -hmm. address how you deal with melody and how much melody needs to go in? Uh, yes. Um, I, I think I probably, like a lot of people, learn the hard way of <laughs> doing too much. Uh, you know, I, I try to be uh, very professional and very artistic with, with my work, and I want melodies to be beautiful, and I want people to fall in love with them. Um, and in reality, using them in, in this production music environment, very often you'll find out that they're going to use a version of your cue that doesn't have the melody in it. So that'd be a, a stem mix or you know some sort of alt mix that doesn't alt have... Alt mix, right. Yeah. Because why? Because the melody probably is conflicting with dialogue. So if, if you do get cues that, that have melody still in them uh, when it's merged in with the video, it's probably a melody you've used that's that's either you know a very simple melody, um, it has a limited uh, a dynamic dynamic range, a melodic range. It's just unobtrusive. Um, something that Steve and I talked about, he didn't really understand the bullet point that I sent you guys in the email. Um, would you like to know if different types of que types of cues work better for some types of shows than others? Um, we're not just talking about genres here. So he said, well, I'm not really clear on what you meant. And frankly, I didn't remember what I meant at the time that I wrote that. But we did figure it out after, uh, right before we started the show, which is take the example of attention cue. Uh, we talked about this. I can't remember. Did we talk about this on the show already? Uh, that it's a broad thing, or was that before the show? No, that no, was before the show. <laughs> okay, so tension cue. Uh, tension cue can be many, many, many types of tension cues. So can you talk about, maybe give a few examples of types of tension cues and the types of shows or scenes that they would be used in, just to show, to make this point? Yeah, I think we, we determined that um, a genre, like if you call it tension, is similar to what you, you, if you would use the genre country. There's many flavors of country music and the, and the same goes for, for tension. So there's uh, like crime drama tension, uh, there's uh, horror tension, there's game show deliberation tension. Um, you know, it, you could probably break it down into you know, 10 or 15 different uh, types of tension. And, and they all have different characteristics that, that uh, make that type of tension cue what it is. Uh, a deliberation tension cue probably wouldn't w work in a horror scene for tension. Right, because horror might be like um, some something discordal or discordant, whatever that word would be. Um, that's A little bit more atonal. Yeah, increasing in, in volume and sustained, whereas um, game show tension might kind of resemble a ticking clock, the passage mm -hmm. of time or something mm -hmm. like Can you yeah, elaborate a little more than sure. I can in my yeah. very non crime Crime drama uh, it typically has like a um, uh, an ostinato uh, or a, uh, it's, it's a rhythmic bass part, dun, 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 which is the same as like a ticking clock, but it's in a lower register. Uh, actually, I have a cue that has both. Yeah? You want to play it? I, don't, I didn't oh, bring it. I didn't uh, bring that one. Wait, is there one on there called Homicidal? Yes. Play that one. Clicking. It's double time now. 
that's a subtle little thing you did to create so a build and move it. Right, yeah. creating a little bit more tension, a little bit more um, excitement. And on its own, it could be for a different type of scene than when it was half that much. Right. Okay, so I actually used a stopwatch for this, and I mean, stopwatch represents time. Mm -hmm. You know, you're running out of time, and by doubling the tempo of the stopwatch, it, it sort of increased the intensity, and used it as a percussive instrument, not meant to really, you, you're, you're really not supposed to be thinking of it as a stopwatch. Right, because you don't want to insert sound effects in your stuff because that'll make the editors probably not use it because if they need sound effects, they want to decide what it is. Exactly. But in this case, yeah, I mean, unless you really thought about it, you wouldn't even really recognize it as a stopwatch so much as percussion. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, yeah, it didn't cross my mind. Yeah. Uh, that's one of those cues, though. You do need to test a mix with playing it at a low volume. Because if they use it in, uh, a lot of times on TV, they, they put these cues way low behind dialogue and stuff. Yeah. And the only thing you're going to hear are the high-pitched instruments. So if all you're hearing is that tick, 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 that can be really annoying. So it's... Let's try it. Um, go ahead and play. Uh, go to like second half of that so we get to the, the double time ticking. Right. And hit play and I'm going to... Oh, I do hear like the hand clap more yeah. than anything, but I don't hear the ticking, so that's good. Yeah. Yay me. Okay, so cool. as you guys hopefully heard, um, we're listening to see if the stopwatch poked through, and that was the thing that you mainly heard at a very low level because, as Steve said, they oftentimes will mix cues really, really low. Um, hi-hat is something that I hear a lot, especially with as much hip-hop as is out there in the reality show market in particular. Uh, and and hi-hat has a lot to do with hip-hop. And when I hear low cues, sometimes I think, how did the editor let that through? Because you can't hear the bottom end. You can't hear anything at this level other than the hi-hat, mm -hmm. which could be distracting mm -hmm. with the dialogue. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Somebody asked a question, and we will get to some Q&A uh, momentarily, because I want to try and give you guys a good chunk of time this time, which I did not last time. Um, how long from the moment you have the idea, this is the kind of cue that I'm going to do? Let's say you're responding to a taxi listing, so you already know the genre and the style of cue you're going to um, create. How long is it from start to finish on average, it, it, honestly, it depends if it's a if it's a genre or a style that I'm comfortable with already. Um, attention cue like this, I didn't have that quite that comfort zone. I mean, I've done a lot of attention stuff before, um, and reason being is because they actually ask for like hip hop drums, and that's not really my strength. Um, so I I kind of had to learn a little bit about hip hop. Okay. Um, I mean, this might have taken me 10 hours to do, which is kind of long for me normally. I, I try to get cues done in about six hours. Okay, uh, and is it safe to say that something really simple, like a swampy cue that's literally got two instruments in it, might be an hour or two? Yeah, honestly, an hour or two. Wow. Yeah. So this is just me personally because I want to see everybody come up a winner. I want to see everybody be successful. But my personal advice, knowing a lot of folks like Steve, a lot of composers, and virtually all of them started out as songwriters, go back to Steve's original advice at the top of the show, which is find something that's in your comfort zone that the industry is looking for and is at the, the nexus of those two things. And... If you're a guitar player, um, swampy cues are just, they're still being used. Any of the shows that are like backwoodsy, um, people have beards, <laughs> or they're running around uh, 
yeah, chopping down trees, shooting alligators, all that good stuff. Um, those cues are usually an instrument or two or three, something like an acoustic guitar, just doing a whole note, brown, or a finger picking arpeggio, um, and then a you know bottleneck slide, and then maybe a harmonica just doing wham wham or something. So those are easy. Do that repetitively until you become so fast and so good at that that then you can take on something else. Don't go from um, swampy acoustic to orchestral in a 30-day period because you'll get turned off and your heart will be broken by the taxi screeners or the library and then you're going to stop. So right. graduate yourself up, right? Yeah. Um, have some success before you have failures. That's a great line. I'm going to steal that from my book. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else do I have on my sheet of magical? Oh, um, we talked about templates a little bit last time. I'd like to expand our discussion of templates mm -hmm. because they really help you get faster. Um, I don't know that creating a template is what I would personally choose or recommend to do first day, first cue. But early in your arc, relatively early, is it a good, tell them what a template is and why they help the workflow so much. Uh, well, it's a, it's a template in a DAW is a, uh, a project that has been prepared ahead of time that has all of the tracks that you would need to write a cue in that genre. So you save the project, so you save the mix and then save the project as swampy basic or something right in, in my case I will use templates for orchestral because I'm gonna have 250 tracks mm -hmm. I have 35 tracks for woodwinds and 50 tracks for brass how do you get all those guys in that room in your house right <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just it just speeds up the process now often I might only use ultimately 20 to 25 tracks out of the 250 mm -hmm. But those tracks are available to me, all the different articulations, because there are so many in these libraries. So a template makes sense in orchestral music. In swampy music, probably not, because how, how long does it take to add four tracks? Right. Uh, if you do a lot of this style and this genre and you're using the same instruments, it's helpful if you're recording guitar and you have a particular EQ that you know that works, and you have the compression and reverb. Uh, you don't want to have to recreate those all the time, so th that kind of makes sense. Um, there, are, there are ways to create uh, track templates rather than a project template. So I bring in an acoustic guitar template, which has all that EQ and reverb settings already which set up there. Which has got to save you half an hour on the front it's, end of that thing easily. It's a tool. Yeah. Anything that helps speed up the process, and we talked about being efficient. You want to get through this stuff quickly. You, don't want to relearn how to use your DAW every time you start up. You don't want to relearn how to set up an EQ every time you, you know, put a microphone, plug it in, point it at the guitar. Um, take care of that business. Find something that works for you. Over time, you'll get better at it and quicker. And then when you know you need to make adjustments, it's easy to do. Uh, how many cues do you think you did before you got to the point where you were pretty fast? where you felt comfortable, you know, it's kind of like getting a new car and you don't really know where all the stuff is in the car and then after, at some point, you could grab it all with your eyes shut, hopefully not while driving, uh, <laughs> unless you're in a self-driving car. Um, I mean, it's kind of, it's, that's a good analogy that it's got to be like driving the car. You just, you know where to stick the key, mm -hmm. you, know, you know how to put it in drive because all the cars are the same. You just know where these features are and you know how to, how to drive the machine. Um, when I was doing a lot of dramedy, I was doing this little couple stuff, I did about 80, 80 cues for them. So I had a template of or orchestral instruments that I knew I was going to use all the time and different shakers that I was going to use, different percussion. Um, so by the end of doing all of those, I was able to, to do from start to finish three hours from com composition On each one. to entering the, the cues, working out the articulations, mixing stems, all of it. I mean, that, that's really fast. Um, I think the quality was good. I mean, they used the stuff. So, you know, that's I just... That's what counts. 
Yeah, and you have to, right, everything you do, the quality has to be exceptional. You know, you can't really take shortcuts on that. So, uh, but again, once you're doing the same stuff over and over and over. Now, if I was going from dramedy to orchestral uh, trailer music to, to swamp cues, that would slow me down. But the fact that I was doing a big project with a lot, a lot of cues, uh, I was able to go through it quickly. Um, I have one more question I wanted to ask you, and then we're going to go to stuff from the chat room, and Bree has been writing stuff down. Uh, oh. So much of the industry operates on what people really don't want to talk about a lot, which is, give me more of the same. But different. Uh, if if you in your mind come up with what you think because you're the most creative composer in the world, and I've invented a whole new different way of looking at uh, tension cues, um, I would contend you're not going to get a lot of traction because the people, the end users, are going to go, "That's a tension cue." Uh, if it's so creative and inventive and forward thinking that there's a loss of the comfort level in the end user, then you've lost your market. So what would you recommend as, how does somebody add salt and pepper to a genre that's already been beat to death by a thousand or 10,000 other composers? What are the little things that you can add to make yours just a little better? I, I think you pretty much have to wait until Hans Zimmer does it. <laughs> That's and, a great answer. I love it. Honestly, because I don't think we can really be trendsetters in this business because most of the music is based on something that's in, in popular culture, in film, in pop music. So when Hans Zimmer does the, the droney stuff, then that's what's going to become popular in production music. Brilliant answer. I mean, I, I would love to be able to add a bagpipe to... Uh, my tension cues, but you know what? Hans Zimmer's not doing it, so it's it's not going to go anywhere. But when he does, when he does that banjo everybody thing will want in one. Sherlock Holmes, then that's what everybody wants. Uh, seriously, from the three hours or so that you've spent on these shows so far, that was your best moment right there, Steve. Oh, thank that you. was great <laughs> advice. Excellent advice. You know, and, and I know I'm going to get emails from people who are going to say, so really what you're saying, Lasco, is that you and your little company endorse people doing more of the same mediocre BS, the, you know, blah, 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 and you're stifling creativity. I just got that email about Thursday of last week, the old you and your company are stifling creativity, to which I say, you know what? Uh, there's no law that says that you can't do both. Uh, I've brought this up before. You can paint houses by day and create your, you know, landscape masterpiece at night. Same thing with music. Right now, you're, it's just, it beats being a barista or a ditch digger or a, well, maybe it doesn't beat being a circus clown, but um, if you can do what you love by day, and get good at it and fast at it and get to know your uh, your DAW really well and get to know the limitations of the software within the DAW and get to know how to use templates better and learn how to um, meta tag your stuff correctly. All these things that are part and parcel to becoming what Steve is and our other successful composers. There's no law that says at 9 o'clock at night you can't do your other thing or spend a whole weekend working on the grand opus it's just a, a way to earn a living doing what you love and it's the industry's not asking you to reinvent the wheel it's just coming up with um a tire that lasts a little longer has a little better more efficient tread on it, it you know it's mm -hmm. a, it's mm -hmm. an incremental improvement maybe mm -hmm. on what has come before but it ain't bagpipes on your tension cue <laughs> yeah uh, I think <laughs> he, he wasn't listening to. No, I, <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah. absolutely true because I'm, I'm thinking about back in, in when I was trying to be a songwriter, and I, and I heard this a lot from Taxi in my early days, where, where people would say things like, um, you know, well, first of all, Taxi would say, you know, it has to be commercial, it has to sound like this band or something. So one of our listings would reference that, right? Okay. And and somebody uh, in, w would argue, yeah, but listen to. The Grateful Dead or some some band, they did this. Their right. lyrics were like this, and the the thing with the difference is that when you get to that level, 
in a band, you can do whatever the heck you want. As long as you have fans that are buying your records, then you can do it and they'll love what you're doing. Uh, but right now, we have to do what's what's basically on the top 40. Mm -hmm. We have to follow those trends. And, you know, so it's, it's similar to like the, you know, the Hans Zimmer example. Until somebody else is doing it and makes it into popular culture, right? Then you know, then we can do that. I love it. You, you know, it's not your responsibility to set the trends. It's your responsibility to give them more of what they want and that they can yeah. use. It is. It is. I mean, if if you want to write that opus, you, there's a place for that, but not for production music. You know, you you can write, do a concert and, and write avant-garde music and you know, and have that bagpipe in there for, you know, that orchestra. I can't wait till the day that I get to come to your bagpipe concert. Um, okay, questions. Bria is handing me questions. These are all questions that have been taken from the chat room while Steve and I were talking. Um, and I'm going to filter these a little bit because mm -hmm. some of the stuff we talked about last time. Uh, do we need to worry about unique song titles? You mean a, a song title that nobody else has ever come up with? I, think I don't that's know. That's what they were saying, yeah. Hmm. I don't think that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, you're right. Yeah. You uh, need to have a, a good song title, one that's very descriptive of the cue, that has meaning, but being entirely unique. I mean, how many songs are titled I Love You? Far too many would be my guess. Uh, as a matter of fact, this came up when I was listening on Sunday to the audio recording of, which I can't share with you guys because there's some copyrighted stuff from TV shows that happened in the ballroom. And uh, so I, I can't give this recording out to people. But um, anyway, uh, the editor uh, actually addressed the fact that uh, they usually start at the top of the list. So, uh, somebody in the audience asked her well what determines what's at the top of the list in the bin where they grab their cues from and remember you know they're going to have a bin for tension cues a bin for romantic piano cues uh, another bin for um oh i don't know uh, you know horrific cues anything that might go into a show they're going to break them out by genre or by situation or something uh, whatever works best for the editor and the music soup working on that show. So if she said, you know, I got to be honest, uh, all of us are a little lazy. We start with the first thing on the top of the list. And she said, but before anybody runs out and names all their cues Alexander's Aardvark or something, because they want to be an A and B at the top of the list, she said, sometimes after a number of um, times using the that bin we get tired of using the first five or ten or fifteen cues so we'll just sort from the bottom up and start with disease and, and work our way down so don't think that you know yes uh, there's a little advantage in coming up with a b c cues cues that start with the letter a b or c or stuff that is z x w or whatever the alphabet is in reverse um, and maybe there's a, a, a wasteland in the middle of the alphabet. I don't know, but uh, don't go out. She made a point of saying, please don't go out and name all your cues Alexander's Aardvark or whatever. <laughs> uh, this one's such a broad thing. Um, if you're licensing cues regularly, what kind of income range can you expect to make annually? <laughs> Does it get any harder to answer than that one? Mm -hmm. uh, Three hundred and twenty-seven dollars <laughs> is, is the exact answer. Uh, your mileage may vary. There's, there's yeah. no way to answer that. Uh, it depends how many years you've been doing it, how many cues you make. I know people that make a lot of cues, but they're cues that aren't needed by the industry. Uh, they have a habit of. of I, I'm thinking of somebody in particular I know that does incredibly good work, impeccably good work. But the cues that this person makes are stuff that when I hear it, go, wow, that's really well done, but it's going to get requested like once a year. So go for the things that you hear being used in the genres that you're comfortable working with. That is a good part of the success formula. 
Um, and I would say expect that in the first year you're not going to make anything. Goose eggs, zeros. Second year, a few hundred bucks. Third year, a thousand or two. Fourth year, three, four, five thousand. Yeah, I, I equate it with uh, learning how to run a marathon. You're not going to go out tomorrow and just run 26 miles. And live. And, <laughs> and live. Uh, yeah, there, there was a uh, period uh, when my wife had a, a brilliant idea when I turned 40. We're, we're going to run a marathon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nice going, Leon. And so we, uh, oh, this is my, my other wife. Okay. Is, so we're no longer married, so. <laughs> well, for good reason. This is why. No, but <laughs> we'd go out, and the first the first week, you, you would run one mile. And then you would every day go home and run one mile, and you keep running one mile. Next week, you come back to the training, and you run two miles. Yeah. And you progressively get better and better and stronger. And by the end of uh, three or four months, you're running 20 miles. Wow. You know, or 15 miles, whatever it is. And then you ran right past your wife and just kept going. Kept going. <laughs> Bada boom. Oh, man, I can do ex-wife jokes all day long. It's one of my favorite subjects, um, even though it's been like 30 years. Uh, oh, this is a great question. Steve, have you found the 80-20 rule to be fairly accurate for the success of your cues? I do personally. I, I actually posted something on Facebook a, a couple months ago that I had um, it, it done a little bit, and I had based this on on, on TuneSet uh, reporting, based on the on their detections of, of the number of cues that I have with them, and it, and not all my cues. I have like 230 cues or something with with TuneSet, and based on the number of placements that they've detected, uh, it was right up there that. 80% uh, of the uh, the number of, of placements or number of, of detections mm -hmm. um, was about 80 80% of the highest numbers were of 20% of the cues. I mean, it was it roughly fit that rule. It's funny how life is. It's called the Pareto principle. 80% um, of your income will come from 20% of your endeavors, if you will. And I hear this over and over and over from composers. So while it's a numbers game, um, you can't just merely say, well, if I create 100 cues, I'm going to make X amount of dollars. But you can know that about 20 of those 100 cues are the ones that are going to generate the most. just works out that way. Um, do you ever use drum loops? All the time. Uh, which DAW do you use? I, I am now a Cubase user. I was a uh, Sonar. K I was a Cakewalk user for 30 years until uh, Gibson ran him out of business, and now I've um, gone to Cubase. Okay. Um, have you ever had any reliability slash workflow issued with PC Mac system mix? And that's too. I, I don't understand that question. I'm sorry. Um, how many libraries are you personally in? Your music? Mm, not that many. I've I've always kept the number small. Um, maybe around ten or twelve. Okay, so that's not nothing. Uh, it breaks my heart when I see people. Uh, library love. You know, they get their first thing in the library, and the library owner says. What else you got? Or can you give me, you know, other types of tension cues? <gasps> they love me. Yeah. And, and they get very attached and they feel like they've got a relationship with that library owner. And they stick all their eggs in that basket. While that library may be really good at getting tension cues placed, they may suck at orchestral stuff or they may mm -hmm. suck at swampy cues because they just don't have mm -hmm. those relationships with those shows. Yeah, see, when I meet a new library... Um I will often give them only two or three cues just to kind of see how well they work. I don't want to give them a ton of stuff. Um, so I've got several libraries that I've, you know, I'm waiting to kind of hear, get the results from mm -hmm. before I invest too much with them. Now I have other libraries that I get a, lo a lot of placements from, and I'm going to keep supplying them with, with cues. Um, and it's, you know, they're new libraries all the time, and a lot of these guys are just learning the business too. and Maybe some of them have good connections for a while, and then they kind of fall apart. So I, I try not to invest too much into a single library. Uh, just don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. 
Makes perfect sense. Um, how can a songwriter, this is very apropos of today's episode, how can a songwriter edit his or her songs to make them more suitable for film and TV? Uh, for example, a three minute and 30 second song, what are some tips that make it more sync friendly? A song with lyrics? Is that um, they about? didn't specify, so let's look at a song with lyrics and, a, and taking the lyrics out and making it into an instrumental. Yeah. Well, if it's with lyrics, I mean, I, I think this is where Robin Frederick is, is you know, the, the queen of everything. The queen of everything, <laughs> right, because, you know, she, she'll teach you about writing songs that are generic, uh, that have, you know, a singular message that's not specific to, you know, a town or to a person's name or something, to make it friendly that would fit in, uh, in, in you know, any scenario that's just dealing with a specific emotion. Um, you know, lyrics are not my forte, so I, I'm, I'm not working uh, with songs. Okay, so let's say that you've written a country song and you want to turn it into an instrumental cue or an instrumental. We should talk in a minute about the difference between instrumental cue and instrumental. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're going to take a song, strip out the vocal. What would you do editing-wise? Would you do any overdubs uh, to make up for the lack of vocal melody? What approach might you take? Or would you just start from scratch? Well, uh, the first thing I do, I would take out the, the vocal and replace the melody with some instrument, an A instrument, and possibly uh, uh, start with one instrument playing the melody, go to a different instrument playing the melody, go to a different instrument. It doesn't have to be the same instrument all the way through, uh, just to give it some variety. Um, the structure of songs, verse, chorus, bridge, etc., does not necessarily match up with cue structure. Uh, forms of A, B, A, for example, where in, in cues, your A section is your primary thematic material, whereas in a song, what's your primary thematic material? Is it the verse? Is it the chorus, which is the hook? You would hope. Um, so, you know, that plays a little bit differently. Uh, I, I think you could, you know, if you figure out, you, you, once you have that, on an instrumental uh, where you take in the vocal out and replace it with melody, edit it, change it around, put the chorus first and then the and then the the verse, and see if that if that works in a stronger way. I, I would also even look at taking the verse and making that one cue, or maybe you know looking at okay if I edit the verse uh, is my A section and then take the bridge and make that my B section. That might be one way to approach it. You could take the chorus and do the same thing. Just slice and dice. Till or you take see. any of those pieces, verse, chorus, and bridge, and you have three tunes. Yeah. And, but then again, is that melody going to be obtrusive with, with dialogue? I have a solution for that, which is my own personal invention over the years, which uh, is called Melody Light. Um, rather than hitting every note of what used to be the vocal melody, because it's now going to sound like 101 strings, doing cheesy elevator music, just give them like the first note of every bar or something. Well, that, that's true. A lot of a lot of songs uh, re repeat a note with with many words or many many vowels. Yeah. So you could make it one long note, a half note, or whole note, or something. Something to give it some sort of melody, but without the da -da 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 mm -hmm. exact replication. Yeah. Excuse me. There is my my weekly rock star burp from Rockstar <laughs> Pure Zero. Makes you burp like a mother. Um, let me see. Oh, I'm being reminded to not let you forget to give away a book. Oh, <laughs> we will give away a book. Oh, we should give away a book. It's actually, yeah, yeah, it's 531. Um, all right, let's give away... We can do, we can do two, two books. books. And whoever wins these books... Um, has to come and get them. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> By the way, speaking of people coming to the office... Um, oh, gosh, what was his name? Who's here last week? Uh, Craig... Uh, Robert. Craig Robart, I thought, did a really good job of interviewing me on this. Don't start typing in your plus ones yet, you guys. Jeez. Wait for, you know, wait for the starting gun. 
Uh, anyway, I, I, I watched um, a chunk of that episode from last week, and I think that Craig Robart deserves a round of applause for coming well prepared and doing a really good job. So, if you're watching, Craigo, thank you. Good job. Uh, okay, so how we vote on the show for those of you who are new, and you can see all the cheaters who didn't wait to, wait for the starting gun to get off the line there. Uh, when I say go, because I am the boss of all things on Taxi TV, you guys type in plus one, and at some point, what? Do it once. Yeah, do it once. Don't do it like 50 times. Come on, be magnanimous. <laughs> um, and. Uh, I'm going to have Steve take this magic pen right here and go like that on the screen in the chat room. And whoever he hits is who is going to win the first book. And then we will give you Bria's email address so that you can send her your stuff and she will send you a book, which will be autographed by Steve. Sure. Okay. Are you ready, folks? Uh, hang on. We need sound effects. Put on attention cue. Okay, this is my tension cue right here. Uh, that was actually a stinger right there. Go. Type plus one. Okay, Rosanna, Rosanna Dana. Rosanna, Rosanna Dana. I know which one you're talking about. <laughs> it's Rosanna, Rosanna Eastman. Eastman official. Yes. Rosanna Eastman. There it official. is. All right, she typed it in twice. She typed it in twice. Whoa, we yeah. may have to I think call. everyone was. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> We're going to single you out, Rosanna. Um, okay, <laughs> so now everybody take a breather, and we're going to do round two for the second book as soon as I see things calm down in the chat room. And for those of you who are watching the show afterwards in the archives, this is why you want to watch the live show, is because you win cool stuff on the show and get to ask your questions in real time. All right, uh, let me see what we've got here for sound effects for round two. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Go. <laughs> That's not the whistle I was looking for. <laughs> I was looking for like a referee whistle. Oh hey, it's, it's, it's got a picture of a whistle. That's harassment. Yeah, it is. I was going to say, nowadays that would land you in jail. <laughs> oh, the suspense. Let's go back. Oh, uh, that's too fast. I can't even grab on that, that one. Okay. Robert something. Robert else. else. Robert F. Else. Okay. Congratulations. Rosanna and Robert, you guys are big winners. Um, okay, we should wrap up so we don't go incredibly long. Let me find my notes to see if there's anything I need to mention at the end of the show. Uh, next week. We're going to have Robin Frederick here showing how songwriters can get out of their dated rut and become more contemporary. We revisit this issue a couple times a year because it's a really common theme. People who have been writing songs for decades and they go, eh, I'm not going to even do it anymore because it's just too hard to sound contemporary. Robin is going to show you some really cool tools, tricks, and techniques that can help you sound um, more contemporary. Bria is going to hold up a sign that reminds me to tell you to subscribe. Click that little red button right down there in the corner. Whoops, not that corner. Yeah, that corner right there, baby. Um, share it. Even if you email it yourself, just do anything you can to make YouTube like us better. And... There you go. Like us. With that, I would like to thank you for coming back a second time and subjecting yourself to these folks because we know they're a tough audience. Um, and my don't, pleasure. Yeah, it's always great to have you. And where's my copy of the book? I personally recommend this book. Okay? It's that good. Um, I wouldn't have him on the show if it wasn't and he wasn't and all that stuff. 
Thank you guys for watching and asking great questions. Steve, we will see you down the road. Thank you, Michael. At the road rally. Yes. It's not sooner. That's the, in a couple of weeks? Yeah. It's in nine months. Oh, man. It scares me, though. I'm actually working on the road rally as we speak. See you guys next right. week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live.